Okay, so I guess I'll start talking now. Genesis chapter 6, and we left off at verse 9. I've explained Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, and verse 9 together. Basically, those two passages are very helpful for you to understand dispensational truth. Now, there's no doubt that Noah, he had a different salvation that time in the Old Testament. And then Noah, his salvation was set up in a faith and work system. The reason why he was saved in a faith and work system is because he had to build an ark. Now, we're going to look at two passages concerning about Noah. Uh, actually, we're going to look at several, but we're going to first of all look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. So I'm going to keep teaching about dispensational salvation, meaning a different salvation under a different dispensation. Yep. And this was definitely the case with Noah. Some people who deny dispensational truth or dis deny dispensational salvation, when they look at Hebrews chapter 11, they claim, no, you'll notice here that the Old Testament saints, that they were saved by faith, which is true, but <clears throat> their salvation by faith is different from ours. When we were saved by faith, we added no works to it. The only work that matters is what Jesus did on the cross. Yeah. Jesus did not die on the cross yet that time. So Noah's salvation, his faith had works in it. Why? Because he had to build an ark. Now, when you build an ark for your salvation, that's obviously a lot of work. Yeah. If I told you to go to church for your salvation, you would accuse me of teaching works for salvation. If I told you to build a church building for your salvation, you would definitely accuse me for a lot of works. Now, if I told you to build a humongous boat that is three times it's as large as a football field or maybe three times larger than that, you would accuse me of being crazy with works. Now, for you to say that Noah was only saved by faith alone, not by works, I mean, you're, you don't know your Bible. So look at Hebrews chapter 11. They don't read about Noah's case, how he was saved. Verse 7, By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. So that's true. There is a salvation by faith, but they didn't keep reading here. Here's his works accompanying his faith. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Notice he became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So yes, he got saved by faith. Why? Because of his works on what he did. If he did not build the boat, he would not have become the heir of the righteousness, which is by faith then. He would have been condemned with the world, right? At verse 7, he would have drowned out with the lost world. But he chose to be separated from the lost world by building an ark. We're going to look at Genesis 6 again, and then Luke chapter 1. I want you to compare the wording of Genesis 6 and Luke 1. Now notice that Noah, when he was saved by faith, there was definitely works accompanying it. And the wording is very clear that there was a work salvation with Noah. If you look at verse 9, Genesis 6, 9, these are the generations of Noah. Uh, I've already explained that part in our last Genesis study. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. So I've explained that part in our last Genesis study, but to expound this part further, notice he's a just man, he's perfect. Why? Based on his walk with God. So notice here, this is not a justification or perfection that is similar to you Christians. That's faith alone, not by works. Noah was a different salvation. Uh, he had to go by a justification and perfection by man's righteousness, not God's righteousness. You, you might say, well, there's no such thing as a just and perfect person by their own righteousness. You're right, but God considers it that way. He judged them by man's righteousness, not by his righteousness. You might say, why? 
because Jesus Christ did not yet die on the cross yet. So he did not die on the cross where he was able to make a legitimate, official standard right. of righteousness for the world. Sometimes he might give out his righteousness here and there throughout the Old Testament, but he can't just do that out of thin air. He has to put, a de he has to put something that has credentials behind it, something that has legitimacy behind it. And that's the cross of Calvary, right? So he had to pay that with his blood. Now, if you look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 6, Luke chapter 1 and verse 6, notice that the Bible considers these people before Jesus died on the cross as blameless just based on their walk with God. Luke chapter 1 verse 6. And they were both righteous before God. Look at that. Same thing like Noah. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Same thing like Noah. Notice it says blameless. How about that? So God was definitely judging them by the best of their ability at that time. We're going to also look at Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14. And then I want you to contrast that with Romans 10. I want you to contrast this with Romans 10. I may have shown you this passage last time, but I'm going to do it again. Romans 10 and Ezekiel 14. So there are too many verses that prove this. One is Hebrews chapter 11. It proved that, yeah, he saved by faith, but there's works that accompanied it. People who attack yours truly viciously online and call me a heretic, they always use Hebrews 11 to prove that Noah wasn't saved by works, it was by faith alone. But they did not even read Hebrews 11. I showed you Hebrews 11. Yes, there's faith in there, but there's works that accompany it. Why do you think today's majority churches are teaching the heresy that, oh, we believe salvation by faith, but there are works that accompany it? Because it's all over the Bible. There's a salvation by faith, but there's works that accompany it. Our explanation is simple, is that that's for different people, different time period. It's not for Christians today in the church age. Right. But then there are people who deny this doctrine, and when you deny this doctrine, that's why you'll end up in the heresy of teaching works accompanying genuine, real faith, whatever that means. Come on, brother. So then all of us will be judging each other about you're not good enough in your works. You're not genuinely saved by faith. Who are you to say that? Who are you to say that? We don't do that. We all base it on the work of Jesus Christ and that's it. That's for today's day and age. So Hebrews 11 undoubtedly shows that. Then we see the other case with Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. That definitely proved that. And then Luke chapter 1 showed that it was a righteousness that matched with Genesis 6-9. And then Ezekiel 14 is the bomb there. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14, verse 14, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own what? Souls. How do they deliver their own souls? By what? Righteousness. Their righteousness. You notice that? It's their own righteousness, not the righteousness of Christ. That's the salvation of their soul. Look at Romans 10. That contradicts Romans 10. You Christians aren't saved that way. You Christians are saved by Christ's righteousness, not your own righteousness. Romans chapter 10, verse 3. God condemns you today if you rely on your own righteousness. Romans 10, 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish what? Their own righteousness. See? God condemns that. Why? Why is it different today compared to Noah's time? Because verse 4, you didn't read that. For Christ, see it's based on when Jesus Christ died on the cross, is the end, oh, meaning there was a time period. A time period of what? Of the law for righteousness. Why? The Mosaic law was their righteousness that time. And then Noah's time, because he didn't have the Mosaic Law, he had to go by the law of his conscience, God's laws. So see, there was a time period of that, but Jesus Christ ended it. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Now, you have to understand this, is that this teaching is not taught 
in the majority of Christian churches and even independent fundamental Baptist King James only churches too. That's why they're very shallow in doctrine. They don't get deep into doctrine. That's why it's so important to be a Bible believing Christian. Why? Because we don't we're not just independent church and we're not just Baptist in our heritage and we're not just fundamental in our faith. We're beyond just fundamentals. We go deeper. We study doctrine. All right. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6, and then we'll look at verse 10. And Noah begat three, th three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now that's self-explanatory, and I'm going to explain every word as I interpret again. You might say, why? The reason why I do that, remember, is so that uh, you can understand every word that you're reading in the Bible. That way you can understand every word that you're reading in the Bible. And that way your mind can interpret yourself as I explain it. And that should be done. That's the goal of every person is that you should explain and understand the Bible for yourself. All right, so what do you think it means? So interpret it in your mind as I explain it and see if it matches. So Noah, uh, through his wife, he was able to give birth to three sons. And those three sons are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I explained this before, so I don't have to explain it again. But this is where all... Today's ethnicity, races, nationalities, etc. come from. They come from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I told you that basic sociology 101 even taught that. But then they changed the terms. Why? Because no matter what term you come up, it will be politically incorrect. So I'm not going to even give the term. Because even if I give the right term to today's standard, guess what? I guarantee you three years later they're going to change the standard again. All right, I took, cult I took uh, cultural anthropology and I took uh, cultural, multicultural counseling. So I know all that, okay? I know all that, all right? Don't give me this jive, all right? Don't tell me what you think. I already know all this, okay? So uh, just give it a couple of years and trust me, you're going to even get the LG. I I've been to a, a discussion meeting of the LGBTQ crowd too. And guess what? They accuse each other of the wrong terms that they used against each other. So I know this, okay? So I'm not going to even try, okay, to give you those terms because it's going to change in time. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> if you'll notice at uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Now it is in interesting. The Bible says the earth it didn't say the earth was corrupt before God. So taking it for granted, the earth is corrupt. It's messed up in God's eyes. But it says also was corrupt. You notice that? That's good. Also, that means inclusive. So there's something wrong with the earth too, which is why God had to drown not just the inhabitants or the animals, but the land itself, the earth. The earth was corrupted. Wow, God takes it seriously. Why? Because the Bible keeps reading here, and the earth was filled with violence. So the Bible says that the entire earth is filled with bloodshed, massacre, violence. So there's violence all over the earth. If we see that violence is all over the earth, there are two things that what I notice here. All right, the first one is the more wild one, okay? So the wild one is the earth also was corrupt, right? Because why? Meaning, if you read Genesis 6 before, we know what was corrupt before. It was humankind, right? Yeah. And the animals. Yeah. But now the land is corrupt. Now if we've taken it for granted by context, by going by the interpretation of context, then we can see the... Uh, illusion here. The, what we see here, what it's alluding to, is in Genesis chapter 6, mankind's corruption was what? That they were intermingling, right? At Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, we saw that. Then Genesis chapter 6, following the context, uh, verses 4 through 7, animals were intermingling, right? then I wonder if you see verse 11, something was going on as well. If we're following the context of corruption here, right? If mankind was corrupt by intermingling, 
and the animals were corrupt by intermingling. And then verse 11 said, the earth also, also was corrupt. Then it would be logical. It wouldn't be too far-fetched to say it was by intermingling. You might say, is that, are you serious? Well, yeah, because we're talking about here, not just, look, if we're talking about just simply something scientific, then that's ridiculous itself. But if we're talking about something that's angelic, spiritual power, and you already got the mutants going around and everybody intermingling with God, whatever was going on right th that time, then we can see right here that anything's possible. I mean, if we already have so many mythology stories, if there's already too many mythology stories about half man and half creatures, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say also as well as about trees that can talk or uh, plants, vegetations that's intermingled with a bit of animal within it. It's very strange, right? So you might say, is that possible? Well, yeah, if you give it a thousand years. Mankind, once they delve into sex, it's endless, right? Why do you think the sexual orientation thing with LGBTQ, that's, it goes LGBTQ+. Plus. And this is within less, uh, probably what, 10 or uh, 10 or even 50 or 100 years. So the sexual orientation thing goes endlessly. Why? Once you experiment and dabble with it, it becomes endless. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, the imagination, see, is endless. So that's why this thing is, uh, anything is possible. Anything is possible at this time. Now, there's a second interpretation here. The second interpretation about the earth also was corrupt. It may not be based upon the sex, but it could be based because of the violence. If you look at the next part of verse 11, and the earth was filled with violence. So there was too much violence, bloodshed all over the earth. That's why the Bible says that it was corrupt. I mean, this would make a lot of sense because we would talk about, let's say for our country, America is corrupt. Now, why, do we, why would we say that? Because we look at the crime statistics, right? And we would say that crime is so high, especially during the COVID situation. And then we would talk about that the city's crime went high and murder went high. And that's why we say that America, see the land that we're living in, is corrupt. So it is logical to think that when the Bible says the earth was corrupt, it's because it's looking at the murder, the crime, the violence that was shed abroad throughout all the earth. If you look at the book of Numbers, uh, well, we'll look at Genesis 9. I want you to go to Genesis 9. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 9. And I want you to look at Numbers 35. Numbers 35. If there's a sin that God takes something very seriously right after Noah's flood, but we'll cover that a little bit more, it's murder. The Lord takes that extremely seriously. We're going to look at Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35. Murder is such a heinous thing that it doesn't matter with what political belief you are or what religion you are of. Practically everyone knows murder is wrong. That's how heinous it is. Let's look at Numbers chapter 35 and then Genesis chapter 9. Now we're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says at verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man and at the hands of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Now isn't that interesting? It's not just humankind, but animals as well. See, so that proves that mankind and animals were both corrupt. But through these uh, corruption of both animals and mankind, God says that if you shed blood, he's going to require it. Verse 6, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man, sh uh, by man shall his blood be shed. See, so life for life. So God takes uh, murder seriously. He says capital punishment for murder. Go to Numbers 35. Numbers chapter 35. Notice at verse 33, 
Numbers 35, 33. It corrupts the land when you shed blood. It corrupts the land when you shed blood. Numbers 35, 33. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are. Why? For blood it defileth the land. And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it, defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit. You notice that? So God takes it very seriously about blood being shed. He says that's what corrupts the land, the earth itself. Why? Did you forget? If you uh, go backwards, not Genesis 6, but Genesis 4, what's the, uh, what's the first uh, public crime? It was murder, right? Uh, you know what? Maybe we'll look, look at that verse. I'm just going to go there very briefly. Remember at Genesis 4, 10? The earth is corrupted. It's crying out. Why? Abel's blood was shed. So the earth was being corrupted right there. That's why God had to curse Cain for the ground he's producing. Why? Because the earth's corrupt. So then to protect the earth, God says then your sin should not contaminate it, Cain. So whatever you do is going to be corrupted. It's going to curse. But see, Cain didn't care. He produced his civilization, right? So because he produced a civilization and they're all over the earth, now the entire earth's ground is pretty much cursed. Not just one in person came. So that's why God had to send the worldwide flood because everything in creation is corrupted. Uh, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 6. That's why it doesn't matter when you argue about climate change, global warming, or etc., or the Green Deal, or etc. It does not matter how much of the earth you protect You'll never protect and produce a perfect earth when there is sin involved. Until sin is gone, then everything will be fine. You've got to realize this. Even when you litter on the ground, why do people litter? Because they're sinning. Some of you Christians didn't know that, okay? So, some of you are like, what? Really, Pastor? Oh, come on. And I can't put my bubble gum underneath my chair after church is over anymore? No, you're sinning. All right, Sunday school teachers should be teaching that to the children too, amen? All right, tell them that's sinning, all right? That's wrong, okay? Uh, yeah, 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 true, amen on that one, all right? I'm very sorry, all right? But, uh, but you got to realize that that is a sin. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 6. Genesis chapter 6. So the earth was filled with violence. There's one thing I want to say about Genesis chapter 6. The theme of everything that mankind seeks after, again, do you notice Genesis 6, what the problem of mankind is? Again, it's always sex and violence. Sex and violence. Love and death. Love and death. Over and over again. Love and death. So what's the theme of every uh, movie that you have to have so that you can get ratings? It has to be love and death. What do you think mankind's problem was with this? And that's why Jesus Christ had to do this. It's to make a comeback against this. Amen. And that's why Satan has to imitate from all the movies what Jesus did as well. All right. So that's the problem in Genesis chapter 6. You notice the intermingling and then the violence. So it is possible that a third interpretation for Genesis chapter 6 verse 11 could be that it's both of them. It's, yeah, violence, but it's also the intermingling as well. So that sounds very logical as well, why the earth is so corrupt. Why? Because plainly there's just sin all over. I also want to add one more thing, which is pretty interesting, is that when you read uh, the ancient text, especially Hinduism, they mention in their ancient text that the gods, what they would do with the mankind is that they would fight each other, actually, during the ancient days, before the worldwide flood. But that there were also bombs and some sort of nuke going off. But if I recall, even Oppenheimer himself, who was heavily involved in this, even mentioned about the Hindu text reading that, before the atomic bomb and everything. So, 
the Hindu gods or the gods of Genesis chapter 6, it is very possible that during that time, remember every man is considered to be Genesis 3, I told you. What was the problem that time? Gods. But remember, there was no polygamy that, uh, not polygamy, excuse me, polytheism. Excuse me. So there was no polytheism that time. There was polygamy too, obviously. We saw that in Genesis 4, so I'm only half, right, uh, half wrong. But there was no polytheism. It was monotheism. Why was it monotheism? Because there were no idols worshipped until after the flood. But that's the first time God's is mentioned as polytheism. But that wasn't the first time it was mentioned. The first time it was mentioned was Genesis 3. Not because of mankind uh, making idols and having polytheism. Every man is considered to be a god. So there were the gods coming down and humans trying to be gods. And that's why it makes so much sense when you read the, the mythology and then the Hindu texts that they all talked about with the Hindu text and then the mythology that there was chaos in the beginning before this huge apocalypse or worldwide flood. Everyone was trying to be a god. Everyone was trying to be a god. Why? Satan said, let's uh, unite together. Let's all be one and inclusive and we can all be gods together. Isn't that what mankind's doing right now? They're trying to say science is the god. Humanism, you're the God. Uh, New Age teaching, there's a God within inside us that we can uh, attach ourselves to. Religions becoming ecumenical. Even Christian churches becoming non-denominational. It doesn't matter by denominations. See, so yeah, this is the devil's doing. And I've told you over and over again, Genesis 4 through 6 is the, the best chapters to look at for current events today and the future tribulation of what mankind is headed toward. And then everything is copycatting, like Enoch's rap and the, his rapture, his walk with God, his generations, Noah. Everything is imitating exactly as today that we're seeing. Genesis is certainly repeating Revelation. And we're going to see that with Noah. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. This book is a prophetic book and it is definitely a historical book. It tells you past and future. It's such an amazing book. No other book like it. And by the way, you only get a King James Bible at a dollar store, at a Dollar Tree store. How about that? All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. And then we'll look at verse 12. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. So obviously God looked down at the earth and... Behold, lo and behold, so to speak, right? Look at it. It's corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So all flesh, they were corrupting themselves in their own way on the earth. Isn't that human nature today? Human nature is that uh, all ways are the best way. You go your way, I go my way. All ways, uh, there are many ways to heaven. That's Genesis 6, 12. They're repeating today. And God says, no, that's not the right way. Look at John chapter 14 and verse 6. Most of you know this verse already. John chapter 14 and verse 6. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one right way to heaven. We're going to look at John chapter 14. And then we'll read verse 6. There is also a passage in Proverbs that... Uh, you could kind of write down. I don't know the passage from the top of my head, but the Bible says there is a way. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but at the ends thereof are the ways of death. But there's another passage in Judges that I'll show you. So see, everyone that goes to their way will lead to death and destruction in the end. Look at John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth and the life. Look at this. There's no other way around. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. See, Jesus, he was very bigoted, you notice. Very narrow-minded against today's inclusive, uh, inclusive ideologies. He says, I am the only way to heaven and you can't go any other way around it. 
Uh, we're also going to look at Judges. Look at the book of Judges. Thank you. So Proverbs 14, 12. Yep. All right. So Proverbs 14, 12 is another path is the passage. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but at the ends thereof are the ways of death. So remember this is that uh, when you go many other ways, it will lead you to destruction. And for these people, it was the waters beneath. It was the flood. And God says, no, there's not only, uh, there's not many ways. There's only one right way, and that is through my way. And then to those people, God says, get in the boat. Get in the boat. But the people, they chose their own ways. We're going to look at Judges chapter 21. Now notice the, uh, this is mankind. Look at, this is a mess. Uh, verse 23, this is a mess, verse 23. And the children of Benjamin did so, uh, chapter 21, did I say the chapter? Yeah. Okay, chapter 21, verse 23, thank you. Chapter 21, verse 23. All right, so there was a bunch of women who were dancing and then uh, like uh, good civilized Americans, they grabbed every woman for themselves, you know. Judges chapter 21, verse 23. And the children of Benjamin did so and took them wives according to their number of them that danced, whom they caught and they went and returned unto their inheritance and repaired the cities and dwelt in them. Man, what, what, that, that must have been a terror for women that time. Verse 24, And the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man to his tribe and to his family, and they went out from thence, every man to his inheritance. And what did the, the Bible say? Look at verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They perceived that as, this is right for me to do. This is, you might think, well, this is a bunch of savages here. But, you know, they think that this is civilized. Just look at uh, this year and last year, you know, protests, they call it. But then if you look at the, what, what they're doing, then you would say savages right there. See, this is, uh, this is mankind. To them, in their own eyes, it's right. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 6. You don't realize what mankind is capable of. Right, right. Yeah. All right? And if you don't uh, admit that yourself, then uh, you don't know too much about yourself or human nature. Yeah. If you're going to be totally honest with yourself, you're going to admit that there are some moments you thought you were right about something, but it turned out to be dead wrong, and it was even hurtful to some people, and it was definitely sin. If you're going to be totally honest with yourself. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And then uh, we'll look at verse 13. Verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. So God is speaking to Noah and he says, You know, all of mankind, human nature, they're going to have an end. It's coming before me now. I'm about to end humanity. For the earth is filled with violence through them. So God says that all of the world is just filled with violence. So there's too much bloodshed. Through what? Their actions. Through their wickedness. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So when God says behold, that means uh, to look. And look, I'm going to just uh, wipe them out. So that means he's serious then. So he's going to wipe them with the earth. Uh, we're going to... Yeah, so I'll explain the other part a little bit later. So in verse 13, obviously, as today's Hollywood celebrity movies will uh, depict it, that God was a very cruel God, right? With the Noah movies that you see. Oh, save us, rescue us, have mercy. And then God just wipes them out. What a cruel God. And some of these people in the ark that you see with the latest Noah film, please open the door for these poor people. And then Russell Crowe's like, no. Yeah. No, we cannot do it, you know, like that. And then you go, oh, what a cruel, what a cruel movie. And then, so, you, so that is the depiction of mankind on God being a cruel God. Now, I'm not going to explain uh, his nature of wrath right now. I'm going to explain it a little bit later. If I don't explain it on this lesson, 
then I'll probably explain it in Next Genesis study, okay? If some of you have a question on that one, feel free to ask me after class. I'm always open to talk about it. Yeah. All right, uh, but uh, we're going to look at verse 14 now, okay? So God says, make thee an ark of gopher wood. So God says, you're going to build a boat now, an ark. And this uh, big boat, this ark, you're going to make it out of gopher wood. Now, no, that does not mean that he killed a bunch of gophers okay, and produced wood out of it, obviously. So for some of you who don't know, gopher, that's a transliterate, uh, transliterated word from Hebrew that the KJV translators did. Why? Because they're honest translators. Okay? They just want to be honest translators. So they tran it's a transliterated word from Hebrew. And uh, gopher wood could be referring to cedar wood. All right. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 6. So then he used cedar wood for the ark. Now notice that uh, it's uh, God's nature that he used. You notice that? It's not a man-made invention. So it's God's raw material of the earth that Noah used. And you're going to notice that as you keep reading. Room shalt thou make in the ark. So God says that he's going to build rooms inside the ark. Why? He's going to put a whole bunch of, uh, if you know the story, a whole bunch of animals and himself. Okay, so he's going to need a bunch of rooms. Room shalt thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Okay, so he's going to put pitch in there. So whatever this pitch is, pitch could be, or it could be, there are several people who have their own interpretations for this. And me, I don't know. But one of it is, could be referring to asphalt. So then uh, he could be probably using some asphalt here. And then so he's trying to uh, put it within the wood and then stick it all together. All right. We're going to uh, look at verse 15. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. So when God says fashion, it's obviously referring to the, this is the manner or the example that you're going to do it. So this is the example which uh, you're going to make the ark. All right, what are you going to make of it? The length of the ark, so the length of it is going to be what? 300 cubits. So the length of it is 300 cubits. The breadth of it, 50 cubits. And the height of it, 30 cubits. So he's going to make the length, breadth, and height of the cubits here. Now, uh, if we look at Ezekiel chapter uh, 43, verse 13. Ezekiel 43, 13. We see a, some huge temple being built at the millennium that God's going to make in the future. Ezekiel chapter 43, and then we'll read verse 13. Now, this is where we get uh, the definition of cubit here. So some people are saying, what is a cubit? What is a cubit? A cubit could be referring to a hand breadth. So in other words, what the Bible means by a hand breadth, some people are saying that it could be from here to here, the elbow. That's the idea about a cubit. So about a man, obviously a man's length. So Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 13. And these are the measures of the altar after the cubits. Okay, so they're going by the cubits here. The cubit is a cubit and a hand breadth. Even the bottom shall be a cubit. So you'll notice here that they talk about a hand breadth. Now, another example where we see about the cubit, for some of you who don't know, it could be the measurement, when they say the measurement of a man, it could be referring to the measurement of an angel, for some of you who don't know. So the Bible sometimes shows that a cubit could be after the measurement or the manner of the angel himself. So if we were going to go by an angel's length, Sometimes uh, we wonder, well, how tall is an angel? 
You know, Mohammed mentioned that he saw like a, I don't know, so many feet tall angel with uh, 200 wings or something like that. So he, he must have saw some humongous big angel or so he claimed to have saw. But uh, it's taken then for granted that angels could be very large creatures. They could be very tall creatures. And Dr. Ugman mentioned that it could be after the manner of those when we go back to Genesis 6. When we go to Genesis 6 here. Going back to Genesis 6. If we were to go back at Genesis chapter 6. Notice that the Bible talks about uh, the measurement of a man, right? For a cubit. The cubit is the measurement of a man. But then who are the men at, in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4? There were, notice what? Giants in the earth in those days. And also after that when the sons of God, see there are your fallen angels, came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. See these giants, right? So these giants were the same, became mighty, what? Men which were of old men of renown. Look at that. So then it could be, it's very possible that their measurement during Noah's time, if they were going after the, uh, the measurement of man at that time, it could be even a giant cubit. So if we go by a giant's cubit, then there is no doubt that the ark is big enough. So the definition of a standard cubit would be 27 inches. That would be the uh, standard definition of a cubit. But remember, uh, the definition of a man's measurement that time, so remember, it's after the measurement of a man, right? You'll notice some verses, which I would encourage you. You can search word it yourself, cubit and man, Bible verse or something like that. And then cubit, it goes after the measurement of a man. But when we go by Genesis 6, it's very possible it could be following the context of the giants. Because their measurement that time were very tall people. But the Bible also shows the angel being the measurement of a man as well. So this is very possible. So that means that there's definitely plenty of space. So then you get your current evolutionist professors, all, their, favorite, uh, their favorite hobby horse to ride on all the time and to always kick is Noah's Ark, Noah's Ark. You can't fit all the animals in there, Noah's Ark and etc. Now I don't know what Noah's Ark has to do with evolution or even with the creation of the universe. Even if you say Noah's Ark story is bogus, then we could go by a different story. And then that doesn't disprove the existence of God. But aside from that, concerning about Noah's Ark, there's no doubt that it was able to fit in everybody because we have to just think about the giant standard measurement that time as well. Yeah. And by the way, concerning about the animals, uh, I'll explain that a little bit more later on, all right, about the animals. Let's go down to verse 16 now, verse 16. A window shalt thou make to the ark. Okay, so they have only one window. So I have one window built over here. So this one window shalt thou make to the ark. And in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. All right, so God says you're going to make a window to the ark. And in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. So right above it, what you're going to finish making... And the top of the ark, the above, is going to be a window. And it's going to be a cubit. So then, uh, if we go by the giant standard measurement, it could be longer than 27 inches. But who knows? And, uh, oh, by the way, so let me explain this part too. So then, if we were to talk about this uh, one window as being their circulation, then you can go, oh, I can't breathe or I'm going to die, right? So that might be one of the criticisms against Noah's Ark. But there are two, uh, there are two possible interpretations to this. Uh, the third one is uh, non-scientific and crazy, you know, but I'll even include a third one there. But the first one is this. The first one is, remember, the atmosphere conditions were very different that time. You've got to realize they were living like a thousand years almost. So then if the air changed quality where it became a little bit heavier or a little bit unhealthy and that's why Noah's family, they were dying earlier years, wouldn't be too much of a big deal because you don't know, you know how much true suffocation there was there in the ark. Yeah. 
You don't know. So you have to think about that one. That's one. And then number two, uh, you don't, uh, just because the Bible mentions about one window that they built, here's another explanation. Just because God mentioned about a window that he built and a door and what to make in the ark, uh, he didn't give further materials on what they should build in the ark either. Because uh, I don't know about him mentioning, I don't think he ever mentioned a roof here to Noah's ark. I never saw that, right? I don't think I see that anywhere in the verse right there. So he never mentioned about uh, a roof or he never mentioned about uh, this part at the front of the boat or other stuff in the boat that I don't know what you ever put in a boat or in an ark. So what does that mean? That means this, it's very simple. In the Bible, it's pretty obvious the Lord doesn't give all the details. Sometimes the Lord will just give what's important details. That's pretty much it. And then Noah, he could put what, uh, and then we don't know what other stuff Noah built the ark. I mean, it never mentioned what color Noah painted the ark either, right? For all you know, it was probably a pink boat for all you know. I don't know. So we don't, there's a lot of things to Noah's ark that's not mentioned in here. So we don't know if there were some circulation vents or whatever. So that's the second explanation. The Bible doesn't give every single detail. And then the third thing is this. Third thing is God's God. He can do whatever you want. It's already a miracle that he survived with all those animals in a universal, in a worldwide flood. Lord can do whatever he want, man. I mean, you have to, you know what's crazier than being inside the ark and surviving? That he would rapture you from this earth all the way up to the third heaven within point zero 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 one second, like he did with Enoch. Amen. I mean, that's absolutely insane, and that's even more crazy. Yep. That's even more unbelievable than Noah and a bunch of animals surviving in the ark. So the Lord can do whatever he wants. Like uh, one preacher said, you know, which is pretty funny, like, how do you fit all the animals in Noah's ark? And then he said, well, how do you not know Noah had a laser gun and shrunk all the animals, and they all fit inside Noah's ark? <laughs> now, he's being ridiculous, but he, had a, uh, but he was trying to point out that Look, it doesn't matter about where it doesn't fit your standard of logic or science because God's the one who created science and everything. What is a miracle? A miracle is something that's outside the definition of, uh, going, of going by the laws of the universe itself, of science itself. So this is something that the Lord is supposed to do. That's supposed to be a miracle. You don't need to make scientific explanations for Noah's Ark. If you do insert scientific explanations over there, then it's not a godsend thing, the flood. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. All right, so what else did Noah make uh, at verse 16? The middle of verse 16 says, And the door of the ark, so then he makes a door to the ark, shalt thou set in the side thereof. So then you'll notice from this drawing, he puts a door over here at the side of the ark. He sets it at the side of the ark. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. So how Noah's going to make the ark, it's going to have a lower story, a second story, and a third story. So it has three stories. Now, uh, there's a, definitely a sermon application that you can put in right here. Now, notice that, let me explain it this way, Noah was able to get in the ark and be saved from the wicked earth out there. And then God invites you to go through the door for your salvation. And then uh, his heaven consists of basically, the Bible says, it's the third story. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a lot of similarity here. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And then we're going to look at uh, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And then we'll read verse 2. Notice that Paul, when he went up to heaven, the Bible calls it third heaven. Third heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. 
Y'all know it. Section 1 caught up to the what? Third, Third heaven. heaven. So in heaven, there are three stories. So then the, what you notice is that... Uh, the heaven where God lives, that's the third heaven. The second heaven would be referring to our current universe. If you recall Genesis 1, did you forget that? Genesis chapter 1, go to Genesis 1. That's your second heaven. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Our current universe where outer space is and then all the stuff going out there. The so-called weird alien activity where Satan and his minions are at. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Now notice at verse 8, And God called the firmament, so he called the firmament what? Heaven. So he called firmament heaven. What is the firmament? If you look at verse 16, uh, verse 15 actually, verse 15. And let them be for lights in the firmament. See that? of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and God made two great lights and greater light to rule the day the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also see it's your current universe that's your second heaven your first heaven we're going to look at Genesis chapter 7 Genesis chapter 7 Actually, it is not here, but uh, it's okay. It's not here, but it is uh, within Isaac's promise. Let me find it quickly. I can find it real quickly here. So Isaac, he gave a promise and a blessing to Jacob, and that would be at Genesis chapter 27. Genesis 27. So I'm pretty sure it's Genesis 27. Let me find it quickly. Okay, yes, Genesis 27, 28. Genesis 27, 28. That's your current atmosphere. That's your first heaven. Your first heaven is your atmosphere. The Bible says, Genesis 27, 28, Therefore God give thee of the dew, see that? Of heaven. So God called where the dew comes from, heaven. So we see that the, our current atmosphere condition would be the first heaven. All right, go back to Genesis 6. So there are three stories uh, representing heaven and salvation. But the Bible says there's a door, right? One door. Now you'll notice, uh, this is a great sermon right here. You're going to notice at verse 12, mankind went their own way, right? But God, Jesus said, I showed you at John 14, there's only one way. Yeah. One way to heaven. And that's why Jesus said, I am the door. Yeah. So we're going to look at John 10. John 10. Jesus declared himself to be the door. Now there's something very important you want to understand about Scripture. One thing you want to note about Scripture is that whenever God gives instructions, He's giving them for a reason. And He likes to follow some kind of meaning behind it. Your God's that type of God. If you, don't, if you didn't realize that about your God, then you haven't been walking with Him long enough. There's one thing I know about God, is that any funny thing He does in my life, He has some kind of meaning or plan behind it. Which is one of the most annoying things about God when you're a child of God. There's some kind of special meaning behind it, Lord. And you're trying to teach me something. But that's God's way of doing things. He's our constant teacher. Why? Because He gave that promise from the Holy Spirit that He'll teach us all things. That's supposed to be a promise. But at the same time, it can be annoying if you're honest. All right. John chapter 10. We'll look at verse 1. What did Jesus declare Himself to be? Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way. See? Just like Genesis 6, they went their own ways. The same as a thief and a robber. So God doesn't like that. But he that entereth in by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. Isn't Jesus a shepherd and we're his sheep? He plainly says at verse 9, verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. That's why Noah was saved. That was his salvation. That's why he had to build an ark. 
Why? Because God gave a promise at John 10, I'm the door. So God gave that instruction to Noah for a reason. I mean, the Lord could have done so many gazillion things to Noah. God could have just told Noah, make a battleship or something, or a spaceship, you know, or underground tunnel, or something like that. Why did he tell him to build a boat, an ark? So he did that for a reason because there's a door right here and three stories that he wanted to make. You want to give him some meaning. You'll notice that he is the shepherd. Uh, at John chapter 10, he declares two verses down, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Noah was definitely, uh, quote unquote, the shepherd, so to speak, taking care of a bunch of animals in his ark, right? There's a lot of hidden meaning you can find here when God gave instruction to Noah. All right, we're going to end it here. It's now 11.30. So let's close it with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray that today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers, made us more understanding of your ways and your workings and your plans on how you operate behind our lives and every word in that precious holy book. It's such an eye-opening book. It teaches us so many things about mankind's nature and about ourselves that we don't know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.